How is everybody doing today? You can be a bit more active. I'm not biting. Yeah, there we go. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. Great to be here in Turkey. Great to be here. And we're going to talk to you today about the strategy of seduction. The strategy of seduction. Let that sink in for a moment. To me, as a car designer, the strategy of seduction is the strategy of design. Well, that was very powerful. It wasn't planned, but everybody's awake now. That's very good. So the strategy of design. Let me show you something. Sorry? Ready? Stop the video right here. I want some answers, okay? What do we see? What do we see? Happiness, yeah? What do we see? Excitement? Smiles? Exactly. We basically see two five year olds here. Right? We see emotion. As a car designer, this is my business. It's the only business I'm in. The business of emotion. There is no rational reason, ladies and gentlemen, to buy a car. No rational reason. It's purely emotion. For those amongst you who haven't Googled me yet, my name is Niels van Roy. I studied here in London, the Royal College of Art. Maybe some of you know it. It's a a car design master's degree, so two years of learning how to be a car designer. A fantastic place, right under Hyde Park, one of the most beautiful parks in London. A very inspirational part of London, as you can see as well, as a car designer. And London, obviously, is a great city, filled with beautiful cars. So again, as a car designer, a very good place to be. And that's where I started my car design studio. Two things we'll discuss today. Obviously, car design, and a very special sector within car design where I can operate in, which is called coach building. And for those amongst you who don't have a clue what that means, don't worry, we'll get to that. We'll get to some projects as well today. This is a project I actually did, although it's a London taxi, for a Turkish car manufacturer called Karzan. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Can I see some hands who have heard of Karzan? Oh, yeah, so that's quite a few, actually. So it's a big manufacturer, and we did some of the work for the future London taxi for that. This, maybe some of you have seen it, is a coach-built car. It's a one-off, a handmade car that we designed. What we did, how we did it, and why this shadowy figure is on the photo there, I'll tell you all a little bit later. But first this. Cars are not special. I hear this often. Who cares about cars? They're everywhere, every city, every country. This could be here in Istanbul, any airport, actually any shopping center. A wall full of car magazines, right? Nobody here thinks this is special. Those amongst you who love cars don't think this is special. Those amongst you who think cars are terrible don't think this is special. And then you see this kind of ads. No reaction. Everybody thinks this is perfectly fine, perfectly normal. It's a car straight from the front. It's white. And it says, the ultimate driving machine. No? All right. Now, let me change it a little bit, OK? The ultimate washing machine. Ladies and gentlemen, a beautiful Samsung. Why are you laughing when you see this? And why is this, to all of you, perfectly normal? The ultimate washing machine. Why is that weird? What if Samsung, or Bosch, or any manufacturer that are in this business would have the power that car manufacturers have? 
the power of design, of good design. Who knows what this is? Audi TT, exactly, exactly. A more difficult question, when was this car introduced? 1996, I hear, it was a little bit later, it was 1998. The first concept car, actually, was designed and shown in 1995, which means the actual design is four years older. We're looking at a 25-year-old car here. And still, it is a very iconic piece of design. Let's have a look at another rather hideous piece of design. This is a Kia, made a couple of years ago. I can't really look at it because my eyes start bleeding. So let's fast forward to Kia nowadays. This is the Stinger GT. They hired the guy, Peter Schreier, who did the TT for Audi, to work on the new designs for Kia. Kia realized, themselves even, that this wasn't really the way forward. Well, fortunately, they realized that, and now they make cars like this. What does that mean? What is that power of design? It's not just a coincidence that all of you think certain cars look good and that all of you think certain cars look bad. It's a science. And let me show you. Before Peter got on, and 10 years later, they doubled market share, and they doubled the amount of cars sold in Europe, and here's the science, in the States as well. This is not a coincidence, ladies and gentlemen. This is what good design does to a company, and it starts with a brand DNA. In the old days, that was very simple. You bought a Volvo if you wanted to be safe. You bought a Mercedes-Benz if you wanted to have a sturdy car. And you can see the sturdy happiness inside of that car. Some German happiness there. <laughs> An Alfa Romeo. Terrible cars, ladies and gentlemen, these. They were rusting straight out of the factory. Just, you bought one and it started rusting. But people didn't care because they were amazing driver cars. People loved their Alfa Romeos. Who knows what this is? Citroën, yeah, and which one? Some Citroën, yeah, that's pretty close, yeah. It's a, the SM, actually, a very special car from the 70s. Terrible cars, very unsafe, but people loved them. Most people will recognize this, right? It's a Porsche 911. If you wanted to have a sports car in the old days, you went to Porsche. That was it, maybe Ferrari. But now, now Volvo, the ones that used to make very safe cars, are making very sporty cars. And now Mercedes-Benz that were making these boring, sturdy cars are making these shouty, outlandish sports cars. And Alfa Romeo, the ones that were building these good driver cars but terribly unreliable, are making cars that are actually, well, let's say, more or less reliable. It improved a lot. And Citroën is making cars that are safe. Otherwise, you can't even sell them anymore. It's not allowed. And now this, the Porsche Cayenne, it's a big SUV. Porsche, the manufacturer of sports cars, is selling more SUVs than they are selling sports cars these days. More SUVs than sports cars. So what does that mean? Everybody does everything. So much on offer. Everybody does everything. All cars are safe, all cars are reliable. So why would you now buy a certain car? Purely and only because of this. And in whichever, whichever type of work you're active, this is something really important. Design is changing lives. Good design is changing lives. It's because it's touching the soul. Remember that little boy? <gasps> Ferrari. He was maybe five years old and he knew what that meant. And you do that through a deep philosophy, a so-called brand DNA. And just like your family, you have to imagine maybe you have a sister. Your sister looks like you, acts like you a bit. Within that same family, you are recognizable as being from that family, as being sisters. But you still have your own individual character. So a proper car brand has a big family, has a lot of brothers and sisters, but they're all individual characters. Design is passion. Again, remember the little boy. 
but also remember yourself washing your car in the weekend. There's no rational reason to do that. You just go through the car wash and it's clean. No, but people want to wash their own cars, want to have that connection with that object. Do you ever wash your computer or clean your washing machine? Equally passionate? No. Why is that? Before we dive into the studio and actually see the work I'm doing, we'll have a look at considering car design. How car designers look actually at these cars on the road, how they design them. Through proportions, surfacing, and jewelry. Three steps. That starts with uh, proportions. Proportions are seen from 10 meters distance. All of you immediately recognize that on the left-hand side is not just a human being, it's a woman. It's not just a woman, it's a young woman. You all recognize that. Why is that? It happens in the core of your brain. When we basically got out of the sea as little fishes many billions of years ago, we had to know the difference between the proportions of mama, which was safe, and the proportions of the predator, which was very unsafe. So it's in the core of our brain to recognize that. The left hand side, 10 meters distance, and the right hand side. Who recognizes the car on the right hand side? A Rolls Royce, right? Purely and only because of proportions. That is the power of just getting the proportions right. Surfacing. Surfacing is the surface or the skin of the car. So on the left hand side, we zoom in. We go from 10 meters distance to a meter distance. We see the structure underneath. We see where the power, the muscles are on the body. We see where the power is being put on the road. On the right hand side, that same Rolls Royce. Anatomically correct around the rear wheels, you'll see the power. You see the muscles that have been sculpted in there. Surfacing. And then the last step, jewelry. Think of your loved one. And then look him or her deep in the eyes. You go straight to the soul. And the same goes for cars. Jewelry is equally important as the proportions are. Let's have a look at these proportions in real life. What does that mean? How could it mean? How could it work? On the right hand side, you'll see a BMW 7 series talking about proportions. Have you seen that grill? It's a bit big, right? The packaging is what's underneath. Remember seeing the lady, seeing the bone structure, seeing the muscles over the bones? Cars have packaging. What is underneath? On the right hand top corner is the 7 series we just saw. A Lamborghini here, you see how the engine and where the human beings fit in on the package, on the chassis, determine the looks of the car. A sports car, a family car, right? Tiny engine, three seats, gold retriever in the back. These proportions are forced by the packaging. So, let's have a look at that 7 series again. Only a few percentages smaller. And suddenly it looks like a, a, some sort of beached wheel, right? It's, it's hideous. Bigger wheels or smaller wheels? Let me show you how car designers see that. Because this happens a lot. Car designers design a beautiful car with a beautiful set of wheels. And then the bean counters come in, the people that count the money. And they say, oh, Niels, these wheels, they're ridiculously expensive. I mean, the body looks good. Why don't we just use smaller wheels? Nobody will see it. The body still looks good. Proportions are very important. Back to the 7 Series. And let's go back in time. Back to the first 7 Series. Some people say car designers are lazy. I mean, what changed between this car and that car? Nothing much, right? Have the same window shapes, still a sedan, 
Well, uh, specifically for these people, on the old proportions, I photoshopped the new car, just to have a look at what that does. There you go. It's rather terrible, right? But you see, I didn't skip a beat. It's exactly as the old car was. And this is what they did. Proportions, and here we haven't touched the design yet. We haven't touched the surfacing. We haven't touched the jewelry. Proportions are super important to how you all perceive cars. It shows that design is not a veneer. It's not a sauce you put on top of something to make it pretty. Design is a way of thinking. And car design even is psychology. Let me just show you something. Can we have sound? Inverted it, but hello. Oh, wow. Your eye tells you oh, wow. that's poking outwards, and yet it isn't. That's the inside oh. bit. And your eye refuses to believe it until you oh. get to that. That's good. Oh, you're twisting my melon, man. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> your eye thinks it's seeing something. It's not, but it refuses to actually register what it's seeing. It tells you the untruth, because that's how it should be, according to your brain. So I'm going to ask you to all stand up for a second for me. To be a bit more active. OK, thank you. Yeah, we can do some, uh, some more gymnastics even, if you want to. I have a few, I have a few images I'm going to show you. And I want you to not think, I want you to react to it. These are images of faces on objects. What I want you to do is shout out, in English please, my Turkish is a bit rusty, what you think the emotion on the face is. OK? We ready? In three, two, one. Most of the people see either a sad or an angry alarm clock. And that's true, because remember the Mercedes, it's uh, made in Germany. <laughs> anyway, we all see this angry face here. Immediately, all of you. We'll do it another time, OK? Which emotion on the next image? In three, two, one. OK, we're a bit of a mixed emotion, I think. Some people were surprised. Some people said happy, but nobody sees angry buttons here, right? Nobody. OK, the last one, I promise. In three, two, one. <laughs> I don't think anybody of you wants to meet this tree at 12 o'clock midnight in the bad part of Istanbul, right? <laughs> you can all sit down again. Thank you very much. So now you see how this psychology works. And even nature does this, right? The wings of a butterfly. Dan was just talking about looking at the wings of butterflies. Let's do that. Eyes, fake eyes on the wing of a butterfly. So we car designers, we steal that. Imagine you're on the highway. You're making good time with your car, right? Pedal to the metal. And then this car is coming in your rearview mirror. It's flashing its lights. You're not going to take that overly serious, are you? No, right? You can say, oh, yeah, well, OK. Same scenario, this car. Psychology. You immediately see a difference in character between these two. And it's just the same bits of metal and glass and a bit of plastic. You do that immediately in the core of your brain. So, having said that, car design is empathic. What does that mean? Well, you have to have the full holistic overview, empathic to itself, to its own brand. What is our heritage? Where do we come from? What is our culture as a company? Where are we now? Very important. Where are we going in the future? But you have to start with that big overview, seeing it all. Before you can dive into the small details, literally the fibers of the material. 
have a think. What is the essence? What is the essence of a material of a Rolls Royce? You, you picture something now, right? I just put a picture in all of your brains. And now picture that for a Renault. It's different. Why is that? Car design is empathic. Yes, to the brand, where it came from, where we're going, but also to you, our customers. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Audi in London. What do we see? What do we see? Don't be afraid, I don't bite. We only see one car in the showroom. One car. Why is that? Well, because they have power walls. Big walls similar to these, but way more higher in resolution. And people can design their own cars there. You can come in with your favorite jacket and say, well, can't I have a color of my exterior that, that matches that? And, and can I have these wheels that I like so much? And you see it happening real time, straight in front of you, full size. And then there is the driving scene. Do you see it on the top? Driving scene. The press of a button, you see your future car driving away. Well, that's all a bit ridiculous, maybe, you think, right? You can even design your own interior with a bit of aluminum there and maybe a leather steering wheel. OK. So this totally irrational, idiotic idea in percentages, how much do you think the sales increased at Audi London? Who thinks more than 20%? I'd like to see some hands. OK, 30%? A lot of you think nothing or some more hands? 40%? OK, some more hands. 50%, that would be totally ridiculous, right? A 50% sale increase through this system. 60. 60%. Can you imagine doing that to your own business? A 60% sale increase. OK, let's do another one. Percentage of new customers that didn't shop with Audi before and that were told by friends and family, oh, you really got to go to Audi London because you can get, design your own car. More than 30%. Can I see hands? Who thinks more than 30%? Who thinks above? Oh, it's positive, I like that. Shall we have a look? 70%. That's unbelievable. And for no rational reason, all these people spent, and here it comes, on optional extras, the stuff you don't need, like stickers and bigger wheels that we designers like so much, that amount of money. You can buy a car for that, ladies and gentlemen. Not a very nice one, but still, right? 11,000, almost 12,000 euros, purely, purely because people were touched in the soul, not the ratio. So, now you know the basics. Let's go to the design studio. Welcome to a lovely summer's day in London. It's always raining, as you know, in London. And if it's raining, and you're waiting for that taxi to come through the rainy weather, you want to feel welcomed. So when we designed the future London taxi for Carza, this Turkish company I was just talking about, we made it very visible for new passengers, tourists in London who are not familiar with these cars. This is basically street furniture, right? This is not a car. Don't think of it as a car. See it as street furniture. See it as the, the red London post box or the Who knows what I'm talking about? The phone booth, right? Also red, also street furniture, or the London buses. We'll show through light, if you're inside of the car, where you're getting out, so you don't step into the puddle, but you step around it. Or if you're approaching the car, this is where the door is. So it's not just for you as normal person, but also for those who are partially sighted, people that are visually disabled. They can see where the door is because of the high contrast in light. It's not just for them, 
It's a social design. We warn people, watch out, please. Somebody is exiting the car at this side. London is busy. We warn people. Very important. The windscreen of this taxi is upright. This is not aerodynamic, I can tell you that. But it's not that important because a taxi is usually driving in the city and specifically in London, the average speed hasn't changed since horse and carriage. Right? So these taxis drive very slow, about maximum 30 kilometers an hour most of the times. Aerodynamics are not important, so we put that windscreen up straight. But why? Why do you think? Why did we do that? A bit louder. Good to see the city. It's actually the other way around. It's so you, standing outside in the rain, can see the face of the driver. This person is going to take you home. You want to see a face, not the sun or the rain in London, reflected in the windscreen. And then the back of that design. What do you see? You see a tapering window line. It gets smaller towards the back. Why? If I'm sitting in this taxi, I want to feel cocooned, protected, safe. These people studied for four years the taxi drivers in London. They know 25,000 streets by heart. These are truly amazing taxi drivers. And as a designer, you don't only want to smash some glass, you also, you also want to make people feel safe when they are with the safest drivers in the world. So you do that through design. You feel safe because you're sitting in the back, but you can look out because the windows from where you're sitting are opening up. So you can see the skyline of London, you can enjoy your drive, but nobody sees you. You're protected. Let's go to coach building. What is coach building? Well, it's what we're doing based on existing vehicles. So customers come to us with, let's say, a Ferrari, a Rolls Royce, a Bentley, and just like suits, we tailor make the cars exactly for them around their wishes and their needs in a very limited series entirely by hand. This is not mass production, this is the opposite. So in a world of McDonald's and fast food, any car manufacturer is making fast food these days, mass production, we're the slow cookers. Our projects take at least a year before they're finished. I just showed you in the beginning a photo with the gentleman, the shadowy figure as I call him. It's based on the Tesla, perhaps you know the brand, right? They make electric cars. What we do always starts by hand. Every car we design, designs by a simple big pen, a black pen, with a simple white sheet of paper, well actually a lot of white sheets of paper. And then we find a sketch that we think is interesting enough. We do this obviously with the owner of the car. We discuss it, where can we improve, how can we make it even more personal. And this specific customer wanted to have a Tesla, but a so-called shooting brake. A shooting brake basically is what you could call a station car, an estate car. So a longer roof and a bit more boot space, but he didn't care about the boot space, he just liked it because of the aesthetics. So we picked the so-called key sketch. As you can see, it's very early. You can just see how it's done by hand, right? It's very quick. We make hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these sketches. But then we start to polish it and polish it up until we're at the final design. And obviously, we're skipping months here. This was the base car, the original car. And here you can see that car being completely taken apart. And everything that is not dark green is newly made. Made by hand from a flat piece of aluminium. This gentleman, as you could see on the previous image, bought his car in a very dark green. Color is very important, specifically for what we're doing. This gentleman wanted to honor coach building, so making cars by hand, which is a very old, mainly British tradition, through color. Because the color British racing green, sorry, we're getting to a really nerdy level now here, but the color British racing green 
is the archetypal British color. Let me explain that. In the old days, you weren't racing your car for your sponsor, right? If you look at Formula One now, you see a lot of stickers on these cars. In the old days, you were driving for your country. So, Italian cars, Ferraris, were red. Why? The color of Italy. French cars, Bugattis, were light blue, the color of French. Dutch cars were orange, German cars were silver, and British cars were British racing green. So this is a beautiful story that this client told me. And he said, I specifically looked for a car, a Tesla, in British racing green, which is extremely rare. I said, well, that's a fascinating story. Let's respray it. So we actually redesigned the color for him. Why? Because if you design such a specific car, so personal, why would you use a mass production color? A color that is not suited specifically for you. So we designed 10 different sorts of green. Eventually, he picked one. And I'll just show you the end result of that. This is the color right before it was put on the car. And what you can see is a little bit of gold flake inside, right? And this gold flake is just doing the surfacing. We'll come to that a bit later. So the skin of the car, true wonders. Here it is being painted. And there the car is, that mysterious image that I just showed you. And you can see how the light is playing with the surfacing of the car. It's a very personal story for this owner. It's not just British Racing Green with a small twist. It's actually British Racing Green with a small twist, plus a very, very tiny bit of very vibrant light green that we took from the logo of, of his company and that can only be seen under a very specific light. Imagine, the gentleman comes walking up to his car, he parked it, the sun hits the car, and he sees his company standing there. The company he built up from scratch. And this gentleman is so important, he is the shadowy figure, so during the photo shoot, we involved him. In every single photo that we made, he is present. Here we're looking over his shoulder. Here he's driving the car past the premises. Here you see the color working very well, right? So you see the highlights where the sun hits the car being yellow. And the shadows are blue. It just communicates the surfacing, the skin of the car, that little bit extra. And we like the color so much, we put several subtle touches on the car. This is the rear view mirror seen from outside. We painted it green. The leather, you see the piping, so the edges of the leather seats, the same green. And then we come to jewelry, the details of the car. Our logos are on the car, they're handmade. And each of these badges are actually slightly imperfect because it's not mass production, because they're cast in metal rather than plastics. Every single car has plastic badges. I said, no plastic badges on my cars. This is enamel being sprayed in there by hand. So you will have some very tiny imperfections around the, bo around the borders. That, to me, is the beauty of it, because it's handmade. It's made not by a machine, it's made by a human being. So we put them on each of our cars by hand. Let's dive into another project of ours, the Brad Van Homage. Again, a coach-built project, but a project goes a lot further than the Tesla. This is the original Brad Van. Maybe some of the car lovers out there have seen it before. It was a coach-built car in itself in the 60s. It's so only a one-off. It was made purely for racing. Why was it called Brad Van? It's actually a nickname by the British press because of its straight roof and straight rear end. It's like a van, they said. But it's actually a race car, and it was based on this car. So they cut up this Ferrari to make that. The owner of the car that came to me said, I like this car so much, I'd like to have an homage, a note. I'd like to honor it. So he bought a Ferrari. And then together, we looked at the car, we walked around it. We took it apart. That's always how it starts. We just take things out, 
take the windows out, the interior. And then we start deciding where can we cut this car off, this beautiful bright red Ferrari. Well, there, for instance. So we cut the rear end off, and basically we peel the car like a banana, layer by layer, very carefully. It's not like firefighters. We're not cutting up the car like that. It's very careful. And let's have a look at the proportions of the bread fan. Just like with the Tesla-based car, sketches, sketches, sketches. We start 10 meters away, very quick sketches. And we start turning these sketches around to make them more three-dimensional. And again, a lot of sketches with a lot of different teams, a lot of different ideas, different details. And then slowly, there's a couple of sketches that we start to like. We start to pick them out, develop them. We go beyond what is possible. Sometimes you have to push boundaries, for instance, with a fully glass rear end to see how far we can go before we reach the surfacing, the skin of the car. So you can see these sketches are way more developed, way more polished. And there again, we start discussing the details. Right? Like the wheels, like the air intakes. Same for the rear end. What should we do with that window graphic? How low should certain lines go? That full glass rear end. And the same goes for the front. And of course, also for the jewelry. So the details. We made bespoke headlights for this car. So one-off, tailor-made headlights. You see the sculpted air intake on the front sculpted air intakes on the side. And some of you might wonder, what are these white lines that you can see running over some of the sketches? They're actually there to show the persons that are making this car in clay. I'll show you some images. We're making a full-scale clay model. How exactly the surfacing, the skin of the car, is running. So you can basically see this as a a line of tape on top of a car. It shows you exactly what the skin of the car is doing. And it goes for every single detail of the car. So you can imagine this is a very lengthy process. It goes for mirrors, it goes for tailpipes, and of course for the interior. So we start with a basic interior, and we start looking at different materials, different letters maybe, different positions of, for instance, the rear view mirror, and in the end, we chose Alcantara, a very special material from the race car industry, to develop into the interior. And we literally redesigned it up until the stitches. Can you imagine? We discuss how much millimeters of stitching, which exact color, how blue it has to be. Everything you see is being discussed. So I visit these different ateliers we have very, very often. In this case, the person that makes the seats. And these type of details are obviously very important. They make the project. This will be on the headrest of the car in the same color as the Alcantara. So it's not shouty. And that's what coach building is about. It's subtle. We, di we discuss this with every single client, obviously, and also with every single person working for us in the workshops. So there's a lot of discussion before we go to the next stage. And one of the most important and exciting stages is the clay model. So based upon the car, in this case, we work from the back to the front. We make a full-scale clay model where we can translate the design we made in paper and in a computer into a physical car. We can walk around it. We can see how it works in real light if the shadows and the highlights are working well together. And again, step by step, this clay goes on and it goes off again. We remodel a car like this maybe 50 times, full scale. You can imagine how much time that takes. On the right-hand side, you can see what was left of the base car. Now, actually, we took the entire bodywork off, so we do this very gradually. And we worked on the left-hand side in clay for that to be translated by hand in aluminium. So it starts with a flat sheet of aluminium, and the coach builder makes these panels. So on here you have the left-hand side of the car, a fender, entirely done by hand, like they created cars or coaches, 
horse and carriage, coaches, 100 years ago. Beating on a piece of metal. I hope that this car has made you a little bit curious into what we do. And if you are curious, then have a look at our social media channels, because every Friday we publish on this specific Brad Van Homage, because that to us, that to us is the strategy of seduction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.